Hello, thank you for uh, coming to this quick lightning talk about um, Adopt Open JDK. So I'm Tim, uh, this is George, and we're going to take you through what the project is and what it is we're trying to do. So at the very li highest level, what is Adopt Open JDK? Well, it's a place where you can come to get some pre-built Open JDK binaries that we have fully tested and we're redistributing using an open source process beginning to end. And the point is, it's a place where you can go to get Java that's free today and it's going to stay free into the future. We're serving two different types of end users, people who want to come to our website and download Java directly, but we also have a mechanism by which people can grab Java as part of their continuous integration system. And what we're not doing is we're not keeping any differences between what we have and the OpenJDK project itself. So it's not a fork of OpenJDK, it's a process by which we build and redistribute binaries that uh, relate to the OpenJDK project itself. So from an outside-in kind of view, users will come and they'll come to the website. So this is the Adopt OpenJDK website, and when you, are, when you arrive, you'll see there's a big blue button here, and this is the latest release from our project, which contains the high-quality, you know, free, Open JDK binaries for you to download and use. There are different variants in here which you can choose different VMs or different code streams. So at the moment it's showing you JDK 9, but we have JDK 8 as well. And of course, we're available on other platforms. And we'll talk a bit more about that later on. So that's the user view in from the browser. We also have an API. So for an integration system, Obviously, you need some way of finding out what builds are available and being able to pull them into your build system and use them. So there is a REST API where you can start to pull in a whole bunch of JSON which describes the releases which are currently available on the site, the quality level that they have, and how you can download them directly. So that's the outside in view. If we look behind the scenes, and I hand over to George, he'll describe, and that's how to get to the next Excellent. chart, and there's a pointer on there as well, um, how it occurs. Not that one. Not that one. Not that one. <laughs> that Go one. On. You got it? I think so. I need to present. Yep. That one. There we go. Um, okay, thanks, Tim. Uh, so, yeah, behind the scenes, uh, we've got kind of two main viewpoints in. Um, the first one is the sort of orange box up the top. I know it's quite small, so uh, everyone, hopefully, you got your glasses with you. But, um, We've got the user's view. So everything that the clients come to, everything that developers come to, is hit by Cloudflare, um, which provides for us a whole host of services, um, primarily SSL, but a few other services as well. Um, and that's going to a whole host of servers that we're hosting, including Adopt MJDK, the main website, which is on GitHub Pages, um, as well as the REST API that Tim mentioned, um, an Ansible server, the staging server, which is essentially for web developers to really quickly deploy code and see how it looks. Um, and also Nagios um, and Jenkins, our main build farm. Um, what this whole area here, I'll jump, shows is just uh, some of them, um, some of the build machines that we've, uh, we've currently received. And it's worth noting that the majority of these are actually donated by real companies. Um, I'll cover that in a minute. but. As you can see, we've got a pretty good variety of, of, of coverage here. And there's actually more machines uh, constantly going to the farm. And this is actually a little bit out of date. So I apologize for that. Uh, but I can cover in a little bit more detail what we've got. So if I go to the next page, um, we've got the progress made so far. So we've got a pretty good sort of defined system in Jenkins where we build. We build on a whole variety of architectures, platforms, uh, variants, we build all that in parallel. As each build gets pushed through, it then hits a test pipeline where we run a whole variety um, of tests. The idea is obviously that this tests not only compliance of many tests, but it means that we know that our Java binaries are of a good standard. Um, and again, these are all run in parallel. And at that point, we then deploy up to our website. Um, you can see here it nicely displays that if things fail, we don't deploy. But it's a nice way of actually meaning that everything's done in a nice automation way without you know, many users having to really intervene at all. Um, over here, we've just got some of the uh, architectures and platforms that we've actually currently got builds for, for OpenJDK 8. And I think there's also some others, but they haven't been fully tested. Um, but as you can see, we've got a pretty good variety. We've got some IBM platforms up there. We've got the Linux, the Windows, the Mac OS X. 
We've also got some ARM. We've got Arch64 as well as ARM32. Um, and we've also got some ZOS machines in the pipeline. Uh, but unfortunately, we haven't got any builds for that at the moment. This just shows our nice green Jenkins. There are some red ones, but I obviously remove them from the picture. Um, so yeah, a huge thank you to all our sponsors is one of, the, uh, one of the main things I really wanted to put out here because, as you can see, there is a massive, massive number of, uh, of big companies that are really helping us here. Um, and these are, you know, at their own time and money, providing us with machines and time. Um, and so, firstly, I want to say, you know, as I say, a massive thank you to all these people, but also we are, we are looking for more, more sponsorship. It's a massive project, and without infrastructure, we pretty much can't survive. Um, and so, you know, we have, we have a whole sort of sponsorship system in place where we have different tiers. We have a tier one sponsorship program where you sort of provide some core machines. We also have tier two where you might have a handful of machines or uh, a handful of different services that you could offer us. So as you can see, things like GitHub, um, Bitrock provides us with installers, things like that. Um, lessons learned, that's quite a key one. Um, so this sort of part of the project, it's worth pointing out that there are other things that Adopt MGDK does, um, but this sort of initiative started about a year and three months ago. Um, and it's worth pointing out there's definitely been some lessons to be learned along the way. Um, a lot of, of code has been written, a lot of meetings have been held, um, and a lot of changes have been made. So one of, the, one of the really key things we learned is to have lots of regular calls, lots of regular discussions, but to make sure they're completely open. We want to make sure that everyone is able to see what's going on all the time. We don't want to be having conversations in clo closed doors because that's not how open source should work. So we have regular calls weekly, um, and these are all put up onto YouTube. People can join. There's nothing restricting people from joining. Um, we also use GitHub projects to track a whole variety of issues. So what we want is a system where people can come to us and get uh, report issues through Slack or GitHub, and then it basically keeps the open source model. It allows everyone to go and see what issues are being worked on, and allows people to actually work in the open and help with those bugs as well. Um, it's also wor worth noting that we, um, I think I've got a list actually, if I remember right. Oh, yes, sponsors are generous. Uh, infrastructure providers are often open JDK builders themselves. So what we found when we approached a lot of the companies seen on the previous slide is that they're actually either building or pulling in open JDK from somewhere. Um, and so we've been able to, with a bit of leverage, actually use that in our favor and say, yeah, come along, we're going to build OpenJDK and perhaps you know, one day you can then fetch from us. So it's in their vested interest because they want to make sure that OpenJDK runs on their architectures and their platforms. Um, automate everything from day one. That's, that's one of the other really uh, important facts because we've, we've found out there's a, a whole host of issues. As you can see, we've got 61 issues in the to-do list, and that's just on the build repo alone. Um, so one of the things we learn is, especially with infrastructure work, try and automate everything you can, because it means that you don't have to then have loads of people coming in, getting really excited about the project, and then just doing really boring jobs that no one wants to be doing. No one wants to be updating patches on machines each week, because that's not fun, unless you like it, of course. Um, if you do, join us. Um, <laughs> also, onboarding guide and documentation. This is something where we're really asking for help because um, with a lot of the stuff we've done, we don't have very good onboarding guides written for a lot of the repos. So we have all these people come in, you know, we attract people at conferences and they come and join the project. And then they kind of hit a wall of tons and tons of code and GitHub repos and Slack channels. And they don't really know what the project's doing, why we're doing it and where to look. So one of the real key things we're working on at the moment is creating the TSC. Um, which is where users will sort of hit their front interface and then they can work their way through and work out where they might be able to help in the project. Um, so yes, lots of documentation. It's also worth noting that one of the key things we learned was that with the code you write, um, try, try and avoid code duplication because we're, uh, we, we started the project and we had a lot of code duplication. So it's worth, from the start, if you're thinking open source, keep it simple because otherwise you're going to have loads of people doing loads of really boring tasks to then fix it up at the end. Um, I think that goes back to Tim now. Yep. Yes. So I just wanted to give you a quick um, insight into where the project roadmap is and what we're aiming to do over the next 12 months sort of period. Well, I've kind of scattered them across this chart and I'll sort of them top to bottom. I've called it website 2.0. I showed you the big blue button on the, on the website we've got at the moment. And as we have more versions of Java, more variants of Java, um, that doesn't scale very well in terms of how users uh, get a user interaction with our website. So we've had some discussions in the project as to how the website could be redesigned. 
Uh, and um, you know, that's certainly one of the things which is on our, our roadmap for the year ahead. Um, solid Java 8 platform coverage refers to the fact that you know, we've got a wide variety of machine architectures in the build farm. And Java 8 isn't going anywhere soon. So we want to really ensure that we've got solid builds of Java 8 and all the updates that Java 8 will have in it available as a free download from Adopt Open JDK for a long time to come. Right, we've put a support statement on our website that says that as long as people are maintaining in terms of security and bug fixes, um, any issues that there are in Java 8 as source, we will build it, we will test it, we will redistribute it. Increasing the number of distributors for our binaries. So you know, we will distribute it through the website and the API is fine, but what we're really looking to do is to start to hook in to some other people who are either big users of Java or big distributors of Java people who own the pipeline out to where people get their Java from today. And so to ensure that these binaries are universally used and accepted, you know, we need to start forming those relationships with uh, the users and uh, the distributors to get OpenJ adopt OpenJDK binaries uh, widely accepted. Go bigger on testing. We've got lots of tests in there at the moment. A lot of the work over the last year or so has been in the framework, the way in which we put the binaries through various levels of testing to increase the confidence we have in the quality of the binaries that we're producing. Now, we do nightly builds and we publish the nightlies. Obviously, there we're time limited as to the amount of testing that we can do on a particular build before we publish it as a nightly. But when it comes to release, we put it through a much more stringent testing process. And the test framework allows us to take containerized applications and plug them into the testing framework. The point being that if you have an interesting application, and we have things like Scala language tests, and we have Tomcat tests, and we have um, a, you know, a, a broad spectrum of Java applications, which are key applications that need to run well, you can plug them into our testing framework and if you bring them to adopt open JDK, we can consider making that part of our release cycle. If it doesn't pass this type of test, it's not good enough quality for a release. So bigger on testing. And then as ever, you know, we've seen the very uh, fast release cadence uh, of the Java SDK as it is uh, being defined at the moment. So that we see many more releases coming down the pipeline that we'll be picking up. We have more platform interest, so people are always coming to us asking us to build on new esoteric uh, platforms, um, all the way from Lego bricks all the way up to big mainframes. And so, you know, incre increasing the number of platforms that we use and the code streams, again, as I mentioned, um, you know, different versions of Java plus um, some of the work which is in progress at OpenJDK. So giving some feedback on things like the Amber code stream or um, you know, other long-running projects at OpenJDK, giving them some feedback. A couple of minutes left to go. So a quick call for any help that folks can bring to the project will be really worthwhile. And it covers a broad spectrum. Right? We've, today we've kind of described what the project does at a very high level because we only had 15 minutes to do that. But if you have skills in any sort of areas, whether it's engaging with a community and writing the perfect tweet or uh, a, a really interesting blog entry, responding to people who come on the Slack channel and helping them through that initial onboarding process. If you're into documentation and technical writing, we certainly have skills uh, requirements in that area. All the way through up to you know, bash script, uh, people who are, who are good at uh, you know, debugging Java issues as they get flagged up in the Jenkins test system, and so on and so forth. So it's the full kind of life cycle um, of release engineering from taking the source code all the way through to getting it on a user's desktop. And with one minute left to go, I think we timed it pretty good, I'd invite you to ask any questions of me or George. Yes? Okay, so the question was, are there any plans of moving to Git instead of Mercurial first? Well, as you know, the reference implementation at OpenJDK is using Mercurial. And we're a very sort of Git-oriented project because a lot of the tooling that we use integrates really nicely with Git and you don't get the same level of integration uh, today with Mercurial. So what we actually do is we mirror all of the source code out of Mercurial into Git and then all of our tooling is around that Git mirror. So we don't maintain any differences in Git, we just take a direct copy, 
from Mercurial into Git, and then all of the processes driven from our Git mirror. Does that make sense? I mean, it'd be great if the reference implementation came directly out of Git, <laughs> but that's, that's a different problem to solve. Any other questions? Go, yeah. Uh huh. Okay, so I'll, I'm going to repeat the question because mm. I realize we're being filmed. So the question was, uh, is there any intention for us to provide things like uh, Debian packages or RPMs, um, or would that be something which downstream people would use? Um, the answer is we're already starting to do some installers. We have some pretty naive installers, I think, on Windows. We do have some Debs and RPMs. Some Debians as well? So okay, some so there. some .debs yeah, as yeah. well. Um, and I was going to say we're having discussions with some of those uh, redistributors, but perhaps I shouldn't uh, you know, talk too much about that. We're on, I'm going to get wrong, we're on camera. But um, yes, I think the, the whole sort of packaging and consumption model is fair game for this project. We, we need to ensure that you know, when we get those binaries, they're presented to the end users in a manner in which they would expect them. So we have got the straightforward zip that you just splat out onto your disk. We've got some installers, and we've got Docker images, so people can put a dependency directly on the Docker as well. I think it's about time. I think we're pretty much out of time, yeah. but there are any other... Anyway, we'll stay around afterwards we'll for any other around. questions. So thank Brilliant. you very much. Thank you.